It's good to just sing, to worship, to be together. No one's in a rush to get to your roast beef, right? (laughs) You didn't sound very convincing. (laughs) We're here to worship. So I want you to engage in the most important message you'll ever celebrate as a Christian and the most important message you'll ever hear if you are inquiring about the things of God and a relationship with God and religion. Because anywhere you go, if I were to share this to you one-on-one, I would take five or at the very most ten minutes. And if you were to turn on most TV stations and listen to a TV preacher, you would hear a sentence of this here or a thought of it there. But we don't hear the gospel message from the New Testament taught very often. And you'd be amazed when we teach something like this, how many people say, I've never heard that before. Been a been in America for years. I've been to churches. I've never heard that story. So today, we're going to visualize and talk through the New Testament teaching of God's bridge to eternal life and what it means. God's bridge to eternal life always starts with his purpose. Notice that God created mankind for an eternal bond. Look at Revelation 4.11. Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So notice that God created us. He loves us. God loves us. He wants personal relationship with us. God is not just some force. God is not the search for peace. God is not harmony with our world or creation. God is God and man will never be God. We can't be the creator. We can't be the trinity. We can't be a complete and total uh, sacrificial love. We can't be truth all the time. And we are not perfectly righteous. Only God is God and every person is not a child of God. You will hear people say, uh, all of us, all creation are children of God. Jesus stated the opposite. He said, if you've not sent, accepted me, the one that God sent, you're of your father, the devil. And so God created us to love us, and he wants a personal relationship, a relationship between me and you and the living God. I was 10 years old when I entered that because I wanted a relationship with a heavenly father, and I was told that Jesus was the way to have that. And so he wants that. Look at John 3, 16. For God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But there's more to this relationship that God wants. His purpose also for us is an eternal uh, bond in the sense that he wants to give us the eternal life with him wants us to live in paradise. Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place that where I am, you'll be also. Uh, And he talks about his father's house having many mansions, many uh, places that uh, he is preparing and that we'll live for eternity with God. But that doesn't carry over just to something in the future we look for. Relationship with God is not going to start when we get to heaven. Look what God also created us for, his purpose. Abundant life. Jesus himself, speaking about this, says, A thief, referring to Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that you may have life and have it in abundance. That's John 10.10. That's the words of Jesus. So Jesus... Uh, God wants us to have an eternal bond, an abundant life. Jesus leads us to a life overflowing with God's peace, joy, love, purpose, and meaning. That's what abundant life is. It's all those different things. So here's the first question I want everyone to honestly examine. Only God... And only you really can answer this. No person who knows you, not a spouse, not the person who knows you best, really only you can answer this or be honest enough to question it if it's not so. Do you have a personal relationship with God? 
And how much are you enjoying and experiencing a life that is abundant and overflowing? God, his relationship, his love, his promises are the constant in a believer's life. But circumstances in this world and relationships and finances and health and all of those things change continually throughout life. The earth is dying and the earth will be burned by fire. It's under judgment and all of creation, according to the New Testament, groans and cries out for Christ to return and make things right. But God offers us peace, love, joy, all of that abundance even now. So, abundant life, Jesus leads us to a life overflowing with God's peace, joy, love, purpose, and meaning. Now, that's the start of our visual that I want you to see. Look up at at our visual. It starts really with just this point. God's purpose is an eternal bond with us in abundant life. Here's the problem, and this is part of the gospel. That was forfeited. You say, well, if he created for that, what happened to forfeit that? Well, he placed Adam and Eve in the garden. They didn't have a sin nature. They had complete harmony. They spoke to him face to face. He gave them one limitation. He said, all this is yours to enjoy. I created all of the earth for you to rule over and enjoy, but you cannot eat of this one particular tree. And guess what they did? Well, they ate. Must have been in their teen years. Mankind's problem, and here's what is it, all have sinned. Now, I want you to picture sin. One of the words in the Greek, the Greek language is very visual. And one of the Greek words used for sin literally pictures a target. It's, it's kind of a picture of a mark that God set. So picture a target, and it's, it's set up, and it's got its rings, and in the middle is what? The bullseye. If you're a great, great, great shot, you might hit the bullseye quite a bit. If you're a very, very good person, you might hit God's intent, his bullseye. Uh, What, 90 out of 100 times if you, I doubt it's that many. But Sam, I hit it most of the time. If you're a bad shot or a bad person, and depending on that, well, you know what happens. You miss to the high right and you miss to the left, and then you miss a little above, and, and then, oops, <laughs> missed the target and shot that person in the leg. And, oh, I shot three more people over those next uh, hundred rounds, and eventually I killed somebody. And Jesus said, if you even become angry at your brother in your heart, you have murdered him. Do you understand that I hold your heart as accountable as I do your actions uh, for what you are accountable for. So often picture sin is God's perfect intent for us, his perfect target. Uh, And so that is the first thing I want you to see. Notice Romans 3.23. How many have missed that target? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Think of the most famous, respected preacher you can think of. That's him. He's fallen short. He's sinned. That's me. That is your most saintly parent or grandparent or great-grandparent, you know. That's the highly esteemed uh, TV preacher. It's a bishop. It's the missionary uh, who serves Jesus abroad. It's the pope. It's everyone. And if you mark in your Bible, circle all, not some, not most. Everyone has missed that perfect mark. Only God can feel that. Notice the second thing. Here's another aspect of sin. Sin is breaking God's laws. God says he expects us. He said Jesus fulfilled every jot and tittle, which to us would be he crossed every T, dotted every I, but we can't. And that's not only the things we break God's law with the things we do. If God says We're not to covet, and we covet, we break his law. If he says, honor your father and mother, and we fail to do that one single time, we've missed the mark, broken his law. If he says, do not steal, and listen, it is uh, what season? It's tax season. Maybe your tax season means something different than mine. It always means I owe more. I've never gotten anything back. But Jesus said, pay to Caesar... What is Caesar's? 
and pay to God what's God. If you've cheated the government of one penny, you've robbed God. But sin is not only something we commit. Sins can be a sin of omission. That means we don't do something we should do. God says to love people, and we don't love her. He says to share the gospel, and we don't share the gospel. He says forgive those who've harmed you, and we don't forgive. He says, be kind to others. He says, turn the other cheek if they hit the one cheek. So you're beginning to picture, picture the problem, aren't you? You and I can't stand up to that standard. All have sinned. Look at 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. That means in God's eyes, if I commit one sin... In his eyes, I am lawless. I've missed his mark. I've missed the standard. So look again up on the screen. He wants, his purpose is eternal bond and abundant life. Our problem is that all have sinned. So what is, what is, the, what is the penalty for sin? Look at the third point. Sin's penalty is death. Romans 6.23 in the New Testament says, For the wages... Or the price of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The good news is the second half of the verse. But you got to accept the reality of the first half to turn to the second half. The first half says the wages of sin is death. And death by that verse means separation. It's not just physical death, although when Adam sinned, it set a curse in place that means every man, every woman would die. Every person living in this room, unless the rapture comes first, is going to die. And we don't know when. Could be today. We could live 100 years. We could live 20 years. We could live six months. We don't know from the moment that little child takes their first breath, they're guaranteed uh, to die. And so if it was just physical death that God said sin caused, we'd all be dead, wouldn't we? Have you met any babies that don't sin? <laughs> babies can't walk. They can't talk. They can't reason with you about uh, things. Uh, they can't fight. But they'll let you know and they'll tell you when they're sinning. They'll turn red. They'll shake from head to toe. They will scream at you. They'll grit their teeth. They'll, you'll be holding. They'll arch their back and they'll flail their arms and hit you in the face. Uh, they'll let you know. And so if you've ever noticed that, you have to accept, I don't care how good those parents are, the day that baby's born, if you withhold that baby's bottle 30 seconds, that baby will throw an absolute fit. Why? Because the whole world revolves around them. Tony Evans said something I thought was pretty good. He said, babies are born really small so they can't kill us. <laughs> and then babies are born really cute so we don't kill them. <laughs> so death means separation. Let's look at the three separations. It, it means spiritual separation. Notice that spiritual death separates a person from the life of God. We're all born under this curse of sin and thus God says we're dead or spiritually separated from him in our trespasses and sin. Without salvation there's no relationship. We are dead in our spiritual uh, lives. And it says that, if you'll notice, in Ephesians 2.1. Ephesians 2.1 was written to Christians who had accepted Christ and been born again. It was written to them, and notice what Paul said to the Christians in the city of Ephesus in Ephesians 2.1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. We'll see later uh, how they became alive and, and us too. Now, death is more than spiritual. Notice the second thing. Physical death separates a person's soul from his or her body. What you see on my outside is really just my shell. It is something I can live in. Who I am is a soul. Uh, I, I'm a soul. And you were created by God, every human being, to live eternally. Every human is going to live eternally. 
when you say goodbye to that loved one in the casket and you're crying and you're talking to them one last time, taking one last look, you may reach down and just put your hand on their hand or uh, you might kiss them on the forehead. You're really not talking to them at all. All you're talking to is the shell that God gave for down here. They're gone. Have you ever pulled the cicada or locust off the tree, the little shell? When I was a kid, those are always fun to find. You pull them off. Uh, That's not the cicada anymore. It's just the shell they were using for a while. And so that's what God does with us. He gives us this earthly tent to live in. And so in in the midst of that, we're going to live forever. Uh, Notice Hebrews 9.27. And just as it is appointed for people, all people, to die once, and after this, judgment. So the New Testament book of Hebrews makes it very clear. All of us are going to live, all of us are going to die, and after that comes a judgment. A judgment of being in Christ or not in Christ. And so finally, look at the last, the last form of separation, and it's the worst. There's spiritual death which separates a person from the life of God. Physical death, separating our soul from our body. Eternal death separates a person, both body and soul, from God forever in hell. Jesus said, don't fear the person who can kill your body. Fear the one God who can kill your body and your soul. He can separate you from him in hell. So the Christian's body is going to be resurrected, just as Jesus' body was from the tomb. And the unbeliever's body is going to be resurrected one day to stand before the great white throne and to experience judgment. And if they have not come to God through Jesus Christ, look what Revelation 20, 15 says. Anyone whose name was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So look what this is looking like now. God's purpose is an eternal bond and abundant life. Our problem is that all of us have sinned. So we were all born to experience this. We all are in this from the moment we're born. Sin's penalty is death, ultimately eternal death. But it gets better. That's what the gospel is. Can, uh, we have to address one thing first because this is where a lot of people go wrong. And this is where a lot of TV preachers are leading people straight to hell. you got to listen very closely to this. Can we find salvation or please God by being a good person, doing good things, and living religious lives? Look at the answer. Can we find salvation through being a good person, doing good things, and living religious lives? No. The early steps of salvation include a desire to want relationship with God. But they also require a recognition that we are broke and sinful and undeserving of appearing before God. Remember in the Old Testament, God would say, you can't look on my face. You're a sinner. You're evil. It would destroy you to even look on me in my holiness. And so we have to accept we're broken and humble ourselves and say, I need a reason. That's why it's called salvation. Saved from what? Saved from God's judgment and death. So notice that God declares us wicked and depraved. This is not popular. A lot of churches won't touch it. Joel Osteen won't touch it because it doesn't feel good. And it's going to be aversive to some of you. Uh, but that's the truth. We're all We are not born good. We're not born with an empty slate. Psychologists have rejected God's truth in that. We're not taught to be good or bad. Our circumstances don't make us good or bad. We're bad. Withhold your baby's bottle 30 seconds and he'll let you know. Withhold it two minutes and he'll let you know. Even more. If you watch my two-year-old grandson, Gideon, And he's the sweetest thing, and he's perfect, isn't he? He's my grandson. No, he's not perfect. He's two years old. He's in a great environment. He comes to a church where people love him. He's already learning about Jesus. But get him to try to put two pieces of a toy together and not be able to get it. He will shriek. He will shake like a leaf. He'll fall to the ground. He'll go ballistic because he is mad. Because he is God, after all, in his mind. 
And then he will insist you hold him until he decides to calm down and go about his business again. That's just all of us. So look at, uh, look at a few verses on that. Romans 3, 10 through 12. As it is written, now I want you to notice how many times this says, no one, no one, no one, no one. As it is written, and this is New Testament, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God in and of their own. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. Ouch. That sounds harsh. It's not harsh. It's just truth. And so get the theme, the common theme, the only perfect human, the only perfect baby that has ever lived was Jesus Christ because he was the God-man. So notice Jeremiah 17, 19, and 10. This is in the Old Testament. The heart is more deceitful. Some translations say wicked than anything else. It's incurable. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, examine the mind. I test the heart to give to each according to his way, according to what his actions deserve. So this is, this is the DNA that has been passed down from Adam and Eve and then passed down every sin that's been committed in every family and that DNA has been passed down and that's what we're born with. In and of ourselves, we are not good. We do not stack up to good. We, to God, we can stack up great with one another, but we can't stack up to his righteousness. Look at the second part. Our attempts to do good even are misled and filthy. They may appear to man to be great. They, we may reward them and say this person is outstanding. We may highly esteem this person, but not by God. Notice what he says in Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. Any way you try to come to God, but through the true uh, biblical teaching of the New Testament, Proverbs 14, 12 is talking about. It'll lead you to death. Notice Isaiah 64, 6. six. All of us have become like something unclean, and all our righteous acts are like a polluted garment of filthy rags, is another translation. All of us wither like a leaf. I, it, it doesn't matter how many preachers fill their churches up and become famous and tell us God loves us and he accepts all of us, um, that is a lie. And if you like some of those preachers who smile big and tell you that your blessing is around the corner because God created you just to be your genie and all you got to do is put a quarter in and he'll give you a piece of candy, uh, you're following a false teacher who will lead you to hell. And so notice the first thing. God, e third thing, can we find salvation through being a good person, doing good things, and living religious lives? No. God refuses even our attempts to please and approach him through man-made religion. Even being religious won't work. We know in the New Testament, because we got to the end of the story, we know the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Israel when Jesus came, were carnal. He exposed them. But you had to understand, maybe in man's history, that group of people seeking salvation through a God their people had been around in the past and knew and had relationship with, they were probably as sacrificial in their search and desire to be good. When they tithed, they even tithed all their uh, herbs and things. that they, If they got ready to use a little salt, they'd tithe out a tenth of it and give it to the temple. They were exceptionally, exceptionally revered by all the people. Jesus preached a sermon on the mount. You know that sermon. He says, I've told you, you said, I hadn't committed adultery. He said, if you've even looked on a woman with your eyes and lusted on her, you've committed adultery. I hadn't murdered somebody. If you've even been angry at your brother, you've murdered him. Do you know what the theme of the Sermon of the Mount is? It's found in Matthew 5, 20. Look, for I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. You know what the outcome of that was to the people around them? They said, oh, my lands, none of us are going to get there. And that's what Jesus meant for them to say. What must we do then to be saved? 
Look what he says about these same, this same group, Matthew 23, 27, and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You're like a whitewashed tomb which appears beautiful on the outside, but inside they're full of bones of the dead and every kind of impurity. Ooh. In the same way, on the outside you seem righteous to people, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. I could give you names of TV preachers that have never once shared the gospel of Jesus, and that's them. And they have a huge following. People love them. They're just sweet. They're good. They give me hope. And I read every book they get because it makes me feel like I'm my own God. I'm just moving toward my next blessing. But they've not told you the truth. Look on the screen. God's purpose is this, relationship and abundant life. Our problem with sin, sin's penalty is death, even leading here. But God wants us to have eternal life. That's what the gospel or good news, that's where things begin to turn. And so we have to accept first that we have to look to that turn. Because I want you to look at the next screen. Our tendency, and you must accept this if you're trying to do this. Being a good person, we try to bridge that gap between us and God in multiple ways. Notice there's a huge gulf. We try to be a good person. And we say, not only am I going to be a good person, I have good intentions. I want to do good. So notice that I'm going to have good intentions and then I'm going to do good deeds. I'm going to constantly be serving on boards and things and morality. I'm going to be a moral person. And then finally, the last false thing we do is we say religion. I don't care how famous the pastor's church is that you went to or how godly your parents or grandparents were or If you've studied every religion in the world and tried a hundred different churches, if you've used those as your standard for God to be pleased with you, you've walked down the stairway to hell. So what's the good news? Here's where it gets great. This is the Easter Easter message. Christ's payment, he became our sinless sacrifice. God's perfect love offered salvation through the death of Jesus. Salvation's price was met in the death of Jesus. The debt of our, the wages or debt of sin being death was paid by Jesus. Our judgment that we deserved and our righteousness and wicked hearts and filthy rags as good deeds, those were paid for by Jesus. Look at Romans 5, 8. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. No one in here has to pull yourself up by your bootstraps to come to Jesus. Not one alcoholic in here has to give up alcohol before you can come through Jesus. Not one of you have to give up your addictions or multiple people have looked at me with tears in their eyes and said, you have no clue what I've done, Pastor. I'm going to tell you this. The sacrifice in the body and blood of Jesus is bigger than anything bad you've ever done. And the worst person in the world uh, isn't any more deserving of hell than the best person trying to come to God by their own goodness. We all deserve death and hell. Notice Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. You remember that? Oh, but, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. And then look at 1 Peter 3, 18. It ties all this together. For Christ also suffered for our sins once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring you to God. In the whole Old Testament he told the Jewish people, You can come to me, but you need to obey me. And every time you're wrong, the, the cost of that is you have to sacrifice and spill blood. And the Old Testament picture of the temple is the altar with blood spilt and spilt. And you know you could smell the smell of blood. And the blood being poured out on the altar, that was all a picture looking forward to the Savior who would come. Because that was temporary. It temporarily took care of it. But scriptures teach us in the New Testament that Jesus was the unblemished Lamb of God. And the once for all sacrifice of him took care of that forever and ever. So it gets better. Look, it's starting to look a little better. God's purpose is here. Number one, 
our problem is we've sinned, all of us. Number two, three, sin's penalty is death, and it will lead to eternal death. God created us, remember, for eternal bond and an eternal life. Christ bridged that. When Jesus died, we sang about it all morning long. When Jesus died, he bridged that gap between man and between God, and he became the way. So what do we do? It's not enough to know that. It, now it comes to us. How do we reach that pardon? How do we become saved from sin's penalty? We have to turn and trust. We must repent of our sin and turn from self to Jesus. Now, repent is a big word. Uh, it's not a hard word. It really just means I'm headed this way. I do an about face. I repent a total change of direction and I head this way. What are we repenting of? I change from myself ruling my life to letting Christ have it. I change from attempting to look good to turning to Christ in my insufficiencies. I change from empty religion and just a simple belief in God to a relationship found by faith through grace and then a life that worships God, exalts him above all else. And so notice also part of turning and trusting is we must place our trust entirely in Jesus and believe in him. In Acts 16, 31, they asked in the house, what must we do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household, it's for all of you if you'll believe. Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is the greatest verse on this. For you are saved by grace. That means it's not deserved. We didn't earn it. It's a free gift. Through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's God's gift. It's not from works. So that no one can boast. My appearances don't get me to heaven. My religion doesn't get me to heaven. My being good doesn't get me to heaven. I can't do one thing to earn my way. And if you say, it can't be this simple. It, it is. But it's hard. Because we would rather earn our way than accept the free gift from God. Because that means we turn ourselves over to him. And look at his bridge to eternal life now. And you see the picture. Oh, God's purpose. He created me to have an eternal bond with him, walk with him, an abundant life today of peace and love and understanding and purpose in life. Uh, but I have a problem. I've sinned. We've all sinned. And I've sinned in my heart. I've sinned in my thoughts. And, and I have not hit God's perfect intent, his bullseye with my life. And so the, the wages of that is death. And so, but I want to be saved. I want eternal life. I want to be saved to eternal life. And so what do I do? Well, Christ's payment. He died on the cross for our sin. That's his part. He took care of all the debt, but I have to turn and trust. And then I can come across to that, and that is our celebration this Easter. John 5, 24. That's the verse. Jesus speaking said, truly I tell you, Anyone who hears my word and believes him, God, who sent me, has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. John 5.24 is a verse that's one promise, but it's got three parts. Look at the three parts of John 5.24. Has eternal life, will not come under judgment, and has passed from death or separation to life in relationship, and in an eternal bond. That's our last picture. That's the whole gospel story. I told you the long story because I didn't want to just tell you how to come to Christ today. I could simplify that. I wanted to tell you what not being a Christian is because we have been duped in America. We have a watered-down church, and that's why Christians, so many places, don't look remotely like Jesus Christ. God's purpose is eternal bond, abundant life. Our problem, all of sin, sin's penalty is death, ultimately eternal death. 
I want eternal life, though, in relationship with God. Christ paid the price so that I could. That's what the gospel is, the good news. I must turn and trust in God's promise if I do. And I come through Jesus Christ, who God sent. I'll have eternal life. There'll be no judgment. I will pass from death to life. So to do so today, it's an ABC decision. And you can settle this this very moment this morning. Is you need to A, admit that you've sinned against God and ask him for forgiveness. God, I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. And I recognize now seeing all these verses in your standard, I do not I do not reach those. I acknowledge my heart's wicked, desperately sick. My deeds are like filthy rags. Even my religion, apart from you, is, can look whitewashed on the outside, but it's dead bones on the inside. And so I've sinned against you and ask you forgiveness. Number two, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for you on the cross, rose from the dead, and he's Lord. He's the only way. If you come and say, I might as well put you in with some other religions that I'm kind of tampering with right now, you won't be saved. Jesus is the only way. Jesus says, there is none who can come to the Father but through me, period. And then number three, call upon Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. And by that, by my Savior to save me from my sin by my Lord, take charge of my life. I'm going to put this uh, last screen up again so you can look at it. And Adam's going to come sing a song that's very dear to us. Uh, unfortunately, we hear this. It's a good place to hear it. We hear it in a funeral frequently today. But it's probably even as proper or more proper to celebrate salvation through this song. If you do not know Jesus Christ, you can get up at any point this song. You don't have to come forward down in front of anybody. Just walk to a side. We'll have leaders both sides. All you have to do is pray. Say, I'm ready. Will you help me to pray to receive Christ right now? If you don't pray and you don't deal with this before death, you'll be eternally separated from God. But the Easter story and what we offer you leads to a life and ultimately a life that this song portrays. To my knees will I fall, will I sing hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all I can only imagine, I can only imagine, I can only imagine when that day comes. And I find myself standing in the sun I can only imagine When all I can do is forever Forever worship you I can only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? 
or in awe of you be still or will I stand in your presence or to my knees or will I fall or will I sing hallelujah will I be able to speak at all I can only imagine yeah I can only imagine God the Father, thank you for your beautiful plan of salvation for us. God the Son, thank you for the ultimate price you paid of your body and your blood spilt for our judgment that in your righteousness we could be made righteous through you. Holy Spirit, thank you for quickening us, leading us, and guiding us from the inside out toward salvation in you. We love you praise you and thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. To those who are Christian, go out and enjoy and celebrate Easter today. And if you haven't made that decision, we urge you and plead with you to join us and become a part of our eternal bond and abundant life in Christ. God bless you.